So uh, thank you everybody and welcome uh, to our panel tonight on how we go about avoiding the worst of climate change. It's fantastic to see this appetite for discussing what's got to be the most important question of our times. And I'm Hazel Healy, I'm a co-editor at the New Internationalist magazine. And before I introduce our panel, I just wanted to say a few words to frame what we'll be talking about tonight. So I edited our May-June magazine on this topic, and when I proposed it back in autumn, the other editors agreed that it was important, of course, but asked what did I have to say that was new that would hold our readers' attention. And it was a fair question then, because New Internationalist has been covering this topic pretty much since the 1990s, and over that time we've really looked at it from all angles. The possibility of adaptation to a warming world in a country like Bangladesh analysing who owns renewable energy as much as how you take down the power of fossil fuels, and hearing from the frontline struggles to keep those fossil fuels underground from peoples of the Arctic and the Pacific who are already losing their land, culture and livelihoods. We've also been calling for Western nations in particular to make deep cuts to carbon emissions to fund the Global South to make their zero carbon transition and also to ramp up clean energy. And so what's so extraordinary about the last nine months since I suggested this topic is just how much has changed in that short space of time. So now, the UN, everyone from the UN climate science body, the IPCC, to David Attenborough has been starting to make similarly urgent calls for action. And as a left-wing journalist, it can be quite unnerving to hear a Tory MP say like pretty much everything you've just put in your lead-off article. I know it's a good thing, but it's... <laughs> <laughs> it's just amazing how the debate has moved sort of closer to, to our position. And funnily enough, actually, I first heard Alice Bell, uh, one of our panellists tonight, speak at the Frontline Club seven years ago, and that was a panel about how, how can journalists keep people interested in a story that doesn't change, if you remember that. <laughs> so it's really great not to have that problem, and it does feel like the penny has dropped, in this country at least, and across much of the industrialised world. So 70% of people in Britain want faster action on climate, according to a poll this week, for example. So why is this? Partly it's due to accelerating impacts, which are coming sooner than expected. Fires, floods, heat waves. And so something that used to be scary but quite abstract is now scary, tangible and quite imminent. So that's, I think, brought a new sense of urgency for people. I also think that scientists have upped their game and are piling more pressure on policymakers and, and are framing things differently. So whereas before they might have talked about 2030, they're talking about 12 years left, you know, which I think is an important change. Um, and then in, in step with them, social movements are also upping their game. So you have the phenomenon like the school strikes, which has gone from one Swedish schoolgirl in August doing a demonstration by herself to, in March, 1.4 million children walking out of school all across the world, and that spread completely organically. So it's, it's an environment where these ideas can move quickly. And then you have Extinction Rebellion, who got their 100,000 yeah, 100, member last week. Now, this is exponential growth of these new movements. And of course, the people who've been doing it all along, who sit on different you know, on divestment, legal, various other sort of pressure points, but there's just a big swell at the moment. So it does really seem that we're in a moment of opportunity, at least in terms of the narrative <coughs> around climate change and the solutions to it. So the challenge now, and really the reason for organising this talk tonight, is how we keep the focus on what's possible. So climate breakdown is likely but it's not inevitable, and it can always be worse, which doesn't sound like good news, but it's a reason to always try and make it less bad. Um, and as Al Gore has said, despair is another form of denial, and it can be used as an excuse for apathy and selfishness too. So like my neighbour who says, oh, you know, there's nothing we can do about climate change. I'm just going to keep flying to Singapore so my six-year-old son can see the coral reefs before they're all gone. You know, he sort of champions that response to climate change. So we don't want him to have that excuse anymore. Um, and really, I think the next challenge, so we've established, once we can establish that it's possible, we need to also establish the right solutions and make sure the right solutions are on the table. And I think that's important because the solutions to the climate change story is, is one of dismal failure. 
So it's, it's 28 years since the Kyoto Agreement when world leaders agreed to keep warming below 2 degrees. And in the last 25 years, we've released more than half the carbon ever emitted by burning fossil fuels. And this is despite all the good news. And there is lots of good news. You'll be hopefully reading about it at the moment. Advances in renewable technology, and the collapsing cost of solar and wind that make this transition possible. You know, big new <coughs> policy initiatives like a uh, Chinese megacity, all its buses going electric. And this sense that the calculus is shifting in the world of business, that actually environmental concerns are becoming something that people are really taking more seriously. But despite all that, we're actually speeding up, not slowing down in terms of the rate of emissions. And that's partly because of these four solutions, things like carbon offsets, where I can uh, carry on emitting and pay a poorer country to plant trees on my behalf, or relying on unproven technology such as carbon capture, which is going to remove emissions later on, hopefully, maybe. We can't carry on polluting while waiting for a techno fix. It's just too dangerous and <coughs> risky. And because of the short time left now in which to turn this ship around, I think the, the, the other challenge is to let people know that the changes really must be dramatic and far-reaching and transformative at this time. And it's the scientists who say we need to be on a war footing, not Greenpeace. The scientists are saying that. They're not used to saying things like that. And um, so really, what the science tells us is that we have an outside chance of staying within a two degrees warm world. And that means it's still a choice to fail. So tonight, with this sort of clear-eyed view of the scale of the challenge, we want to explore the ideas and actions that could actually get us out of this mess and preserve a habitable planet. So we'll be asking, are there viable, equitable pathways to a zero carbon society? How do we make the most of this renewed public concern? And what new stories can we tell about the future? We're very fortunate to have a brilliant panel to work these through. To my left is Alice Bell. She's a writer, energy campaigner, and co-director of Charity 1010, which brings people together to tackle climate change. They've just created, I saw on Twitter today, a wind dial that tells you how much wind power the UK is generating at this very moment. They research solar-powered railways and organise tree planting events, and there's probably loads more, but that's just a, a little sample of what they do. Alice herself is a leading voice when it comes to community communicating science and climate change. Clive Lewis, to her left, is the Labour MP for Norwich South and currently serves as Shadow Minister of the Treasury. He was previously Shadow Minister of Energy and Climate Change and is a front, front bench spokesperson for sustainable economics. He's been an outspoken supporter of both the climate school strikers and the idea of a Green New Deal for Labour. To his left, to his right, to my left, is Miata Fambula, who's the chief executive of the New Economics Foundation, which is a think tank dedicated to transforming the economy so it works for people and planet. It also champions policies such as, such as a frequent flyer levy and actually thought up the Green New Deal policy package in 2007. Uh, prior to joining NEF, Miata was Director of Policy and Research at the IPPR and has worked at senior levels for the leader of the opposition, the Cabinet Office and the Prime Minister's Strategy Unit. So let's start with a round of applause for our panel. I should also say before we start, if you are tweeting, the hashtag is NIClimateTalks. So feel free to share your thoughts and comments as they come up. So my first question is to Alice. Last week, this government legislated to introduce a target for net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. How do you think their plans measure up against the crisis we're up against? Um, well, I think it's... I think it, it, was, look, it, was, it was described as historic by a lot of people, and there was a lot of celebration, and I kind of... I was on holiday, and I came back and was like, oh, we've solved climate change. Great. <laughs> I'd, I'd say it's sort of historic-ish, um, it's, it's undoubtedly a good thing that we can take, we can go places from. Um, it's really nice to be in this position compared to the positions that we were maybe a year ago. Uh, similar to things that Hazel was saying earlier, it feels it, it, we are feeling a bit more of a wave of, of action or 
at least rhetoric around, around action on climate change. Uh, but I still think we really can and should press it to be better. Um, there's some major loopholes with respect to carbon offsetting and aviation. Um, also, it's, it's part of a kind of long history that we have had of politicians saying, we're going to do this thing in some sci-fi date in the future. And what we need them to do is say that and make long-term plans, because some of these things are going to take a long time, but also say, we need to hit the ground running, so this is what we're doing now. And it, like, as Hazel said, like, it's been sort of 27 years, did you say, since the Kyoto talks? Um, Miata's organisation was talking about a Green New Deal over 10 years ago. Um, but Roger Revelle, who's this sort of high-profile climate scientist in the States, was briefing Congress in the late 50s. This is not new. We've known we've been, we should be taking action on this for a long time. And we, we know that. Theresa May knows that. She knows there's lots of, you know, we need to be acting fast. And as Hazel said, we need to be able to communicate to everyone that this is dramatic and that we need to be acting dramatically. So what I really want to see from the government is, yes, a great big target, an ambitious plan, but then saying, and now, because we take this seriously and we need to hit the ground running, we're going to be doing this, this, and this now. And there's some really easy wins that they can, they can take right now, partly because for the last few years they have not been doing that much. So we need to lift the ban on onshore wind. It is ridiculous that you cannot build wind turbines in England. Um, it's just ridiculous. Like, a lot of people don't even realise this. And I, say it to people, I said this to some people um, from America recently, and they just looked at me and went, why? <laughs> and it just, just lift that ban on onshore wind. We need a massive uh, project on energy efficiency, uh, not least to counter the huge public health emergency, which is cold homes. We need to electrify the railways and other forms of transport. Again, we've got a big public health emergency of clean air, which this will also tackle. These, some, there are some straightforward things that we need to be cancelling plans for aviation extension. These are some easy things that they can do now. And that's what I really want to be seeing from the government, um, not just big plans about the future. Um, and even then, I would quite like that plan to be a bit bigger and a bit more ambitious. Brilliant, thank you. My next question, I'm just going to skip you there, Clive, and coming back to you, goes to Miata. Neff is one of the original architects of this Green New Deal, which is a bundle of policies to decarbonise society while addressing inequality. Out of interest, who here has heard of the Green New Deal? Oh, wow. Well, so our last event was in Froome, and I don't think anyone had heard of it, so you're more interested in the Green New Deal than Froome. Um, but, so can you give us a bit of information about you know, what this plan is and why you think it could actually work? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the starting point of the Green New Deal um, is a kind of recognition that we face two big challenges. So, on the one hand is the environmental challenge, so everything you've been talking about, uh, the climate emergency, but in the context of the bigger ecological ch uh, crisis that we're facing. So, the fact that we're essentially depleting the world's resources at one and a half times its ability to regenerate, and we've hit a tipping point. Uh, we are now at crisis mode and it requires urgent action. So we've got that looming crisis and problem on the one hand. And then on the other hand, you've got this kind of economic breakdown, uh, which has been kind of long in the making, but has, um, if you like, accelerated since the global financial crisis. So, you know, the fact that actually the economy is growing, but the majority of people aren't feeling the benefits of it. The fact that we've pretty much had wage stagnation for about a decade. Uh, so people are feeling squeezed uh, because they're not seeing a pay rise at the time um, that essential, the cost of essential things are growing. Um, you know, we've got 40 million people in this country living in poverty, one in three kids living in poverty. Um, and, and it essentially says, you know, these are not two separate problems. They are fundamentally interlinked. They're two sides um, of the same coin. And the root cause is the fact that we've got an economic system that does not work for the majority of the people. We've got an economic system that does not work for the planet. And, you know, we can't really tackle climate change or environmental breakdown until we transform the economic system. So the Green New Deal is a, a route to doing that. It essentially says we're going to decarbonize the economy at pace, but we're going to do it in a way that works for the majority of people. Uh, we're going to do it in a way that creates millions of jobs. We're going to do it in a way that lifts living standards. And whilst we're doing that, we're going to fundamentally change the rules uh, that govern the economy, because that's the way we get onto a sustainable footing. Um, so, you know, it recognises that actually we need unprecedented action, but the conditions for that action are in place. So, you know, the scale of the economic challenge, the scale of the environmental challenge, 
that are coming together at the same time, not to mention the political crisis, are suddenly creating the basis for us to really think about what an alternative system looks like. Mm. Um, and so, you know, there are some key building blocks of, you know, the Green New Deal. Uh, the fact is, you know, it's got to be radical, it's got to be ambition, it's got to be about greening the economy at pace, and at a pace we haven't imagined before, because that's what uh, the times demand and the scale of the challenge demands. It will require... Uh, unprecedented collective action and state action. So, you know, unprecedented le le uh, levels of mobilization of resources that we haven't seen in peacetime. Um, thinking about actually how we invest in green technology um, and do that at pace. Um, and then the sort of third part of it is actually in return for what is going to be a huge disruption, there has to be a deal back uh, to the public. And part of that deal are jobs, part of that deal are sort of increasing living standards, but it's also giving them a stake in the green economy. Uh, so, you know, we talk about ownership and a transfer of ownership and power as part of that. If we're creating new green infrastructure, why not make it community and collectively owned so that we fundamentally start changing the way in which our economy works? Thanks. And in terms of concrete policies, a couple that I've read about um, actually from in the US context are proposals to either tax uh, flights or tax other um, high use of carbon and actually to use that money, for example, to retrofit homes in lower income neighbourhoods or to start in cleaning up the most polluted neighbourhoods first and to subsidise people's living expenses so they're able to do that. Can you give us any examples of those kinds of yeah. policies to help people understand what it might mean, an example of what it might mean? Yeah, absolutely. So for me, the kind of the starting point even before we get there is we haven't really been talking about fiscal policy, you know, so basic tax and spend policy uh, for a long time in the context of austerity um, and the capacity of governments to borrow to invest. And that has to be part of the equation. So, you know, the first step is how does the government use its balance sheet in order to do something like this? And, you know, we've done it moments of war um, and you know our contention is my goodness this crisis is much bigger than a war and so we need to be thinking about how you use the public balance sheet um, and that's in part fiscal policy so progressive taxation it's thinking about borrowing now for investment in the long term but it's also thinking about monetary policy so and you know the, within the remit of the central bank so to what extent is the central bank using its mandate to guide finance into clean versus dirty investment? To the extent that we're printing money, why are we not thinking strategically about how we direct that money through bank lending into green infrastructure investment? So for me, that's the starting point. And then you move on from that and say, well, okay, well, once we've sort of created our pot of money, what do we invest it in? We invest it in community energy. We invest it in the green infrastructure that we need. Um, we create the capacity for communities to respond. Um, actually, not, you know, our argument is that, you know, yes, national government is catalytic, but the change will come from the ground. The change will come from communities, uh, from local areas, local government, working effectively to think about, you know, we need to transition in this place. What's the plan for our local economy? What does it look like? Where are we creating the jobs? Uh, where are we creating the opportunity? How are we training our people? What do we fundamentally need businesses to do differently? And you can't have that conversation at the abstract at the national level. You've got to have it on the ground at the local level. And so what you need is to open up the investment to catalyze that. Um, and then you need to kind of create the basis for some of the action that we need to see. The critiques that's come like against the Green New Deal is the worry that it's going to spark a stampede for some of the rare earth metals that are required, uh, such as lithium, you know, in the turbines, in the, um, in the electric buses. And I think it, that points to a kind of wider question about how do we ensure that this green industrial revolution that people are talking about in the West is going to be extended um, to to the global south and so that you don't have smart city Barcelona and DRC, you know, unlivable. So how do we, what can we build in that's going to sort of make it a global vision? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, for, I think there are two parts of it. Uh, so for me, there is no tension between a Green New Deal and our obligations to the global self. Um, and in fact, it's kind of baked into the proposition. So yes, we've got to decarbonize in a way that works for people in this country. Um, 
But actually, that doesn't negate the fact that there is a responsibility, and it's a moral responsibility, actually, as a historical polluter, to make our contribution to enable uh, the process of decarbonisation in other parts of the world. So, you know, for me, I'm interested in the space where we are increasing taxation on dirty industry and putting that into investment in Global South help to help countries um, decarbonise. But also, you know, our, our whole argument is actually there was a huge opportunity in the green transition. It's not just about investment. There is a massive upside and part of that upside will be reinvested back into communities to do the things that we want but actually a slug of it ought to be taken out and used to invest elsewhere um, because you know if we decarbonize in a way that makes sense and the rest of the world doesn't we're still confronting the same crisis and then i think the wider point for me is that and this is a piece that speaks to decarbonizing um, and tackling climate change, but in a way that damages other aspects of the environmental challenge. And what's quite interesting is that climate change is very much in the public consciousness, um, but it is but one, but one facet of a bigger ecological crisis. Um, so, you know, and for me, you know, when you hear the ecologists talk about, you know, the rate at which you were depleting our natural resources, the fact that we're seeing unprecedented species extinction, uh, the fact that by 2025, two thirds of the world population might be in water stress conditions, uh, the fact that we're depleting our fisheries, I mean, this is absolutely scary. And incredibly instructive that it's not in the debate. You know, people aren't talking about it in the same way they're talking about climate change. Um, it's certainly not in the mind frame of policymakers. So there's now this laser focus on climate change, which is brilliant, but it is, it, you know, it, it's been completely eclipsed by a big ecological crisis. So we must absolutely, at the very least, tackle climate change in a way that doesn't exacerbate um, and worsen the, the wider ecological challenge. But our goal must be to try and tackle climate change alongside the big ecological challenge. So, you know, we're trying to shift the agenda from the Green New Deal just, you know, away from just decarbonisation to greening. There is a bigger environmental imperative. Um, and that's the space we need to move towards. Because if we do climate change, but we don't do any of the other stuff, the threat is just ex existential. Thanks. And so my next question goes to Clive, which is back to the, like, the real dirty world of politics and how you get these things turned into a policy. And you've been a vocal supporter of a Green New Deal. Mm -hmm. And there is a group at the moment called Labour for a Green New Deal that's lobbying to get a motion passed at the party conference in September, kind of inspired by the Sunrise Movement in the US and their work with the Democratic Party over there and um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, that's the senator who's championing it. So what challenges will it face um, at conference? Will it become Labour Party policy? How um, do you see it? It will face challenges. I mean, before I get to that, I mean, I, I just say a couple of things to pick up on Miata's point, which was um, when John Mack asked me to do this almost a, just over a year ago, the job, the, the idea was for it to be called climate change economics. It became pretty clear to me after a cursory glance at what the job could entail that it was entirely possible to kind of save the planet, save from climate change, but destroy it through uh, you know, the other eight planetary boundaries that science identified. So we called it sustainability economics because you know, that's ultimately, I think, the point we're trying to make. It isn't just about um, greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. There's so much more going on now. Um, in terms of the politics of this, one of the caveat, one of the kind of warning lights I kind of have at the moment is that we are placing AOC's Green New Deal up on a pedestal. I think what we have to understand is that in the US, this is a, they've never been through rationing in a way that we have. They're a continental economy. And, um, you know, they have a quite big focus on what I would call a Keynesian fiscal approach to um, decarbonisation, they're not really look. I don't think they're focusing on sustainability generally, although they are beginning to look at that. They are focusing very much on the energy side of things. And I think that's a danger because one of the concerns I think myself and many others have is that now politicians across the political spectrum are becoming involved and taking an interest in this, which is always dangerous. Um, they're beginning to, in many ways, um, wanting to kind of fit their own <laughs> their own kind of political objectives into the, into the language of a Green New Deal. <clears throat> and, you know, for some, you know, and you've asked me, would it be difficult to get this motion passed at conference? Yes, it will. 
We have trade unions who are very, very skeptical about this approach. Um, and I think part of the reason Labour has gone for the, the term green industrial revolution uh, is because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's kind of saying to them, look, there's a role for you in this, uh, in this regeneration. Um, and that's why we're calling it industrial. I'm happy with that. I think it's more of a green industrious revolution we need rather than industrial. Um, and I think one of the mistakes that we could make is that we simply lift out our fossil fuels here and then think we can put in renewables and kind of pave the planet over with you know, more uh, electric cars, electric vehicles, and just carry on as we are, but with renewables. And I think that's one of the things that politicians, I can hear them, are talking about, beginning to say, oh, we need to make these fantastic changes to decarbonise, but actually, that's what they're talking about. And that would be a monumental mistake, because what we need to see in the Green New Deal uh, is something so radically different and so transformative that it should scare politicians and the public alike in terms of the scale of the change that's required. And many of my trade union comrades and colleagues can sometimes, because they have a vested interest in their membership, who are in the current jobs, whether that be the arms trade, whether that be in fossil fuels, they have a vested interest in conserving those industries, especially given the kicking they've had from uh, this economic system over the last 30 or 40 years, organised labour has had. And I can understand that. So it's our job as a labour movement to explain to them that this will be a just transition, that social, economic and environmental justice are one and the same. And you can't have one without the other. Uh, and that's really critical. But, you know, as I remember saying to a trade union uh, general secretary when I was talking about um, uh, ending Trident, uh, and I said, you know, it's from, you know, from swords to ploughshares. And he said, you know, we, we're not interested in that because we actually want to see, show me the money, show me where my members are going to come, my new members are going to come from, show me what the industries are. No one can do that. No one has ever done it. Therefore, no, I won't be supporting the end of that. So in terms of can it do it? Yes, it can. I think we may have made a slight strategic, slight tactical error, sorry, in the wording of the motions at, at our party conference, which is to decarbonise the UK econ economy um, within 10 years. And I think, I don't know if it was a typo, but uh, over in the US, what they've done is it's to begin a 10 year decarbonisation program. And they're two very different things. Now, I'm not saying that we can't decarbonise within 10 years because the science increasingly seems to be saying that 2030, 2035, maybe 2040 at the outset is probably where we're heading. But I just think if we're to be able to do this, in a way that enables us to make sure that we can still look out for the very people that we came into politics to look out for, then 2030 could be an extreme challenge. So we have to make sure we can win the arguments. And I'm not sure that we can in 10 years, but let's see what the science is because that's what we have to be led by. But it needs to be a just pathway um, that, it's, that, it, that, it's, that, it, that that trajectory is on. So I think it can be passed. I think if we get the debate, obviously at conference, this year, there's a bit of a fight going on at the moment as to whether we should be discussing Brexit, or whether we should be discussing climate change. Um, and I think, um, I think depending on what happens between now and then from uh, the leader's office on RPV public vote policy, will determine whether we need to have the debate or spend as much time on uh, Brexit and a PV. The final thing I will say is, anyone, I personally believe that climate change and sustainability issues are a bigger threat than Brexit. However, to be able to fight climate change and sustainability issues, it would be a monumental mistake to walk away from one of the institutions that could best serve us to be able to make that fight in the timescales we have. It would be like giving away or throwing away your best tool to do so. So the two are linked and we need both of them together in my opinion, although Europe does need to be radically transformed if it's to be able to play its part in doing that. One of the quite radical proposals in there was to re-nationalise energy companies, which I was very surprised to see. So could you just tell people a little bit more about that? So yeah, it's to, it's to basically re-energise the um, energy networks. Um, and it, the cost has been put at around about just over £60 billion. Pounds. But uh, there are a number of ways that, um, that we've suggested that could be paid for. So for example, uh, pension costs, historical subsidies, um, a bond issue, a green bond issue to those companies would be ways that, that would, would make that affordable. I also have a, a, a slight hesitation in the sense that um, 
I think I think it's necessary to nationalise um, these projects, but I think it should be selective rather than blanket nationalisation. And the reason I say that is because my fear is that uh, we will be in many ways doing exactly what these companies want in some sectors of their uh, infrastructure, because some of it is ageing uh, and old and in dire need of investment. And I don't think that the public, given that they've milked us for decades uh, with subsidies, I don't think the public should be basically paying through the nose for what is in effect 19th century uh, infrastructure, almost 19th century infrastructure. Clearly it's not, it's 20th century infrastructure, but it feels like 19th century. Um, so what we should be doing is saying, um, we'll take this bit, that bit, and this bit, and that bit over there, and all the crap you can keep. Um, and that's what I'd like to see. In terms of that. Thanks very much. Um, your earlier comment gives me a good segue into my next question, for Alice, because you've dedicated much of your life career, I was meant to say that, that life labor, <laughs> to thinking about <laughs> <an> <laughs> skill. <laughs> to thinking about how we can communicate climate change. And you wrote something in Prospect um, just the other day about how actually, although it seems like there's a big focus on climate change at the moment, it's actually once you take it out of the news, it's mentioned far less than Brexit and picnics and rhubarb. What's the other one? Yeah, rhubarb. Yeah, rhubarb. So, you know, we feel... da, 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 that maybe that's why there's so many discussions of <laughs> okay. rhubarb. Yeah. So, so with that in mind, um, how do you think we should actually be talking about the climate crisis, particularly when speaking to those who don't care about it already? Because I feel like you can get a sense that everyone minds about it now, everyone's with me, and then you have a conversation with someone who really isn't, and it's a really good wake-up call. So if you've got something to share on that... People in climate comms, so before I worked in climate comms, I worked in science comms and policy, and they have the same trouble. And I've done bits of work with people who work in economic comms. People in comms often get obsessed with that, the how. Um, they're like, so you have all the endless research projects and focus groups and things to find some kind of magic phrase that will unlock amazing action on whatever you want to have amazing action on. And there are some amazing people who do great work on coming up with better metaphors for different things. And they'll, they'll sort of like craft these incredible metaphors and they'll say, we can transform the public's attitude to whatever. And we all know great catchphrases that have really captured public attention. I'm not saying that words don't matter, but there is a lot of attention on this how, and people sort of sit there and find the way. And they'll have like there's a group it's a really good group called climate outreach to do loads of really good research on this and i remember at one point they did some research on focus groups with the center right and there were loads of people in the climate movement who were like how do i talk to right wing people because i've never actually met one um, <laughs> but climate outreach went and found some initially all of the people they found were men so then they had to find like a woman <laughs> but they got them in a, they got them in a room and they, they then developed some really interesting work on on how people who self-identify in the center right think and talk about environmental issues uh, but you then get people in the climate movement reading this and then taking it as like an instruction manual, like it's a recipe book that's going to create perfect comms interactions with every, to any time you have them and they won't and I think that Although research like that is really useful and we should think about what we, we say and it's great to have really creative people who can come up with amazing phrases and images, we need to maybe focus more on the who rather than the how. The climate movement and the environmental movement generally needs to diversify a lot more. And I mean, that's partly in terms of being less white and middle class, but it's also about who is talking about climate change and where. So actually, that, that when you talked about rhubarb, that gives a good example of that. So that came from a study by BAFTA who were looking at how often climate change is talked about in non-news contexts, because they argued that in order for us to have the kind of big, broad debate on climate change that we need, it needs to be mentioned in like really everyday things, in like EastEnders and uh, Bake Off and stuff. It needs to be in unexpected places. It needs to become actually really mundane. And so they were looking at like where is it talked about and it's not talked about anywhere. You, know, you have the one-off special shows like David Attenborough does climate change and even that's an event because he doesn't normally talk about climate change even though he's an environmental pre presenter but you don't have it on the vegan episode of Bake Off you don't have Ian Beale joining Extinction Rebellion which I think would be hilarious <laughs> he'd be really annoying and everyone would be really annoyed at him but it would give everyone a chance to talk about like stuff I mean you know you should have a massive I mean, yeah, you, you should have these sorts of programmes. And so one of the things that's been really heartening, actually, in the last few weeks is I've had, well, sort of since April when things start to really start to build on climate change, I've had a lot more requests from so people who work in culture, theatre producers, someone who wants to write a musical, um, 
uh, comedians, artists, and I know lots of other people who, who like me, are, are starting to have a conversation with people like that. So I, I'm hopeful that we'll start to see climate change talked about in different places. For me, that's the thing that we should probably be putting our energies into. And then the how, there's new phrases, these great ways will probably emerge from that if we have a greater diversity of people and a greater diversity of places just debating the issue. Mm. That's a brilliant answer. I'm on the subject of Ian Beale and or Extinction Rebellion, I'm sure we have some like rebels in the audience tonight. I've seen a few symbols. Um, as I said before, it's it, like that movement has just got its hundredth member last week, and this sustains activism. I had almost said that the last time, and I escaped, and I did it. Hundred thousand, one hundred thousand member. And uh, I shouldn't have tried to say it twice, that was pushing my luck. And, um, and their sustained activism really does, along with other, like, other actors like the climate school strikers, seems to have shifted the needle on climate policy. But interestingly, the framing that Extinction Rebellion uses is very apocalyptic. And that, you know, like the research that you've just mentioned, all says you, know, you can't scare people because they'll fall into despair, they won't be able to do anything. Um, you know, this idea that alarmism uh, breeds apathy. So what do you make of that phenomenon and, and why do you think they've had such success? I think most of the research doesn't say... It depends on which research you look at. So most people I know who are people like me who work full-time in climate comms, and there's people a lot more experienced than me who do, who, who've worked in climate comms since the 90s, you know, or actually before then. Um, and they, they, very few people that I know who work in, in that specialist sector would say that you shouldn't have any ap apocalyptic framing. Mm -hmm. What they've said and what they've based most of their approaches on for the last decade or so is that we need a mix of things. And certainly, work, so the charity I work for comes from the perspective that you need some hope. And so we do nearly all positive. We, we, we do not talk about the, the apocalypse end of it. But that's not because we don't think that that's important. It's because we think that you need some light with the dark. And that if we were the only climate charity in the country, there is no way we'd take that approach. We see ourselves as a small part of a larger ecosystem. And we know that we only work if there's other people raising the alarm. And I mean, I've, I've had conversations with people from Extinction Rebellion about this, and they say, you know, it's sort of similar the other way around. They wouldn't necessarily use their messaging if they were the only group in town. And, you know, occasionally we sort of said things like, you know, we both kind of need to work together. Um, and, uh, and that's certainly the approach that I've been part of, I suppose, even before Extinction Rebellion, that people would think like that. So I, uh, there has been some criticism of not just Extinction Rebellion, but also some of the stuff that Greta Thunberg said as well, um, that's too apocalyptic. Um, and I, I think there's a place for that. I think that one of the reasons why Extinction Rebellion has sparked in the way it has, and one of the reasons why it even emerged in the first place, was that there was a bit of a lack of that, and that there was a need, particularly after the IPCC report came out last autumn, for people just to have a bit of a freak out. And that is, there are a lot of different emotions that we need to sustain us through this big transformational change that we, we need to, to enact. And some of that is hope, and that's one of the reasons why I work at 1010 and we do the work that we do. But some of that is fear, and we need a space to express that, and we need to express to say that, and to say, you know, this, the, one of the bits of messaging that you get repeatedly through Extinction Rebellion is tell the truth. Now, we can get into complicated conversations about who's true and what truth, but I think that's sort of sense. like, we need to talk about how bad this is and not uh, hide that from ourselves and each other, that people need spaces to do that. And so I think it was probably quite necessary, and I think it's a it's a sign of a way in which the environmental movement at large was failing a bit uh, in the last year, that it hasn't been given giving people space to do that. And it has done in the past, and I think the last few years, there's been other reasons rather than necessarily a fear because of climate change comms framing policies. I think it's there's all sorts of other things they've been working on. They maybe didn't want to... Uh, they knew that their supporters who fund them are interested in that sort of, in some areas. I think for a long time you've seen climate environmental organisations avoid, avoiding talking about climate change. So they'll talk about polar bears, they'll talk about fracking, but they won't, they'll use those as, as ways of avoiding actually talking about climate change because they thought that their supporters and the wider public didn't really want to talk about climate change. And Extinction Rebellion is an example of the fact that they do want to talk about climate change. And now, you know, even WWF, who are sort of maybe the most scared of doing that, is, is using it as part of their key messaging. Um, mm. And so, yeah, I think that's the, that's the shift that we've seen. <coughs> Colleagues who've gone, they give talks like this, and they've heard people come up to them and say, are we all going to die? 
in 10 or 15 years. And they're very worried. I've got quite a few scientist colleagues who are really worried about the fact that the public are worried and children are worried about, uh, about that and that they are unnecessarily worried. I think there are problems with that, but I don't think that's really what Extinction Rebellion are doing. And I think that a bit of time to freak out is probably a good thing. Great. And Clive, you actually spoke at the Extinction Rebellion launch in November last year. What role do you see for social movements like that in influencing party politics? Does it strengthen your hand if mm. the bridges are blocked to yeah. Westminster? And can they complement each other? Yeah, very much so. I mean, they, um, I mean, they asked me to write a chapter for their book on the Green New Deal, available from all good bookshops. Um, <laughs> and it's a very good read. Um, not just my chapter, the rest of it as well. My and <laughs> sorry, you mentioned yeah. my chapter. And your chapter as well. Sorry, yeah. I, I, <laughs> I got to that one yet, yeah, it's probably better than mine. Um, and uh, it's, uh, so, I mean, look, my political party, the Labour Party, started out as a social movement. Um, but over time, political parties, for whatever reason, can sometimes become ossified. We're more of a political, parliamentary, parliamentary local government election machine at the moment. So, um, you know, many of the people in the Extinction Rebellion, some of them are in the Labour Party, many of them are in the Green Party, some of them will be in the Liberal Democrats. I don't know how many Tories there are out of 100,000. There could be some, though. Um, but I think it's, um, I think it's healthy uh, because ultimately political parties respond to where public opinion is. That's, that's how our democracy works. And at the moment, what the Extinction Rebellion have done, I mean, there are a lot of people who are quite on the left as well who were turning their nose up at the Extinction Rebellion as that this was like, you know, they were kind of sneering at what they were trying to do. And... I looked at it and saw it, and saw it for the kind of freak out that I think is, is, is sometimes necessary. You need a pincer movement. You want to offer hope, but you also need to have the opposite of that as well, the reality of where we are, and it is terrifying. But we also need to have hope. And I think the point you made earlier, which is even if we are going to have elements of, of the climate crisis and ecological crisis, uh, by working towards it, we can reduce that. Uh, so it's never a lost cause. Um, and so I think it plays a massive role in us being able to um, give the political leverage to politicians to make, to make the political space for politicians to be able to make the changes they need. I mean, the one thing I will say is if you look historically, I would argue that we are now on the brink of rolling, outside, rolling out of the European Union because of, in effect, what was a social movement. UKIP started out as a social movement. Whatever we think of it, it's never had an elected ME, an MP before. Um, you know, we had two who crossed the floor from the Conservative Party, but it's been an external force which has moved the Conservative Party into a position where now we're about to elect Boris Johnson to kind of take us out of Europe. So I keep going back to Europe. I think that's something that's playing on my mind. Um, <laughs> yeah, but, uh, it, you know, arguably, uh, social movements have a very large and real role to play in, in, tackling, in tackling this issue and making the political space available for us to do what's required. Now, Miata, I was just going to come back to you um, to explore a little bit deeper this idea of equality and, and really what uh, Alice picked up on before about who's talking about climate change and who it matters to. And one of the things um, I did when I researched this magazine is I spoke to lots of uh, climate activists in the Global South, and one of them was a woman, Yvette Abrahams, from South Africa. And I'm just going to read her quote. She said, Middle-class people with their bellies full can tell someone they face extinction in a couple of decades but a decade can be hard to imagine, she says. In South Africa, 49% of people are food insecure and 7 million have HIV. They're thinking, how do I feed my hungry child? And so that's really that point, that unless zero carbon transition brings immediate benefits to the majority of people, no one's going to fight for it. And it can't just be a small group of people fighting for it. Needs, everybody needs to be fighting for it. And I just wondered how you felt uh, this applied to the UK context. You've talked before about... Um, you were born in Liberia, came to the UK, you've got that sort of comparison there. What, what do you think uh, needs to happen for it to matter to everybody? Yeah, I mean, so I think this is, this is absolutely critical. Um, you know, part of the reason why I think climate change struggled, uh, so, you know, before 2008, um, it was always one of the kind of top issues that was, uh, with, that, that was polled. And then in the last 10 years, it's, it's just fallen off. And I remember, uh, you know, when I worked for the Labour Party and I was an advisor and I, you know, covered climate change and uh, the environmental NGOs would say, you know, why aren't you doing more? Why aren't you doing more? And I'm like, because every time we try and do something, the political strategists are telling us the public don't care. You're wasting airtime. 
that's not high on the agenda. Um, and so, and, and I think for me, my reflection on that was actually we were a state where the economy was still and is still struggling, uh, where people are under huge amounts of pressure. And it's kind of, you know, it's, you know, bread and butter issues. It's feeding your kids, it's heating your homes. And in that space, it's quite hard for people to move beyond the immediacy and the pressure of the today to think about an imminent pressure in the future. Um, and I think that is, has always been the challenge for the movement. Um, the then, tra- you know, and th- for me, the other corollary is that the, the interesting thing with the trade unions is they say, you know, we, we talk about this green transition, just transition, and they say to me, that sounds great. Give us an example of an industrial transition that's worked for workers. There isn't a single example, and there's certainly no example in the UK. Well, 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 there's not an example in the UK. And when we talk about transition and industrial transition, people remember the 80s. So how can we galvanise our people around this agenda? So, and for me, that's why the framing of the Green New Deal is so important, because you say, look, the economic challenge that means you're struggling to, you're having to work multiple jobs in order to feed your kids is exactly linked to the environmental challenge. And until we see the two things as fundamentally interlinked and the way that we deal with the environmental challenge has to go back to equity, has to go back to creating a different kind of economic model so that we can deal with the very urgent economic and social issues that people are facing, I don't think we can cut that, cross that barrier. So, uh, you know, I think the thing that is exciting is now that there is a social movement that's emerging around social justice and environmental justice coming together. But I think that's the only way you sell it back to the public. That's the only way you sell it, that it becomes a majoritarian issue rather than a middle class issue. Um, It's the way that kind of cuts across uh, the challenges uh, for kind of industrial transformation because you say, well, we bake this into the response. Um, And just sort of final point on Uh, the social movement. So for me, the Green New Deal uh, is really instructive in this. So we came up with this plan in 2008, and it was done done with a kind of coalition of organizations, but was done in a sort of typical think tanky way, where we came up with a kind of policy prospectus, and we kind of lobbed it out there in the world and said, ha-ha. Um, and nothing happened, and the financial crisis happened, and then everyone got distracted by everything else. And then I think the lesson from the US was that it wasn't just a plan or a set of ideas, it was seeded in a social movement. And the kind of momentum that has emerged there around the Green New Deal is the fact that actually ordinary people, you know, this social movement that cuts across, you know, the BME community to the youth, uh, to, to young people, Uh, all demographics coming behind this plan is a thing that's giving it the momentum and the power it has. So the lesson for us now, and you know, there are those of us that are kind of thinking about, well, how how do we create this plan? What does it look like? Is that it cannot just be an academic and intellectual policy exercise. It has to be rooted and seeded in the social movement so that, you know, there are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of voices calling for this sort of change, because that's how you create the political pressure. But at the heart, it's like, it's a two-prong agenda. It's about the environmental, it's about the social justice. And we, if we hold on to that, that's the route in which we make this into a majoritarian agenda. I, I think the reason, I, to pick off on the back of that, I think the reason for me why this is such a, an attractive proposition and why I think kind of those on the right of politics and in many ways the centrists of politics in terms of those who seek technocratic kind of tweaking I think ultimately the reason they will struggle with the concept of a Green New Deal, which is about a completely new and revolutionary political economy, and we're still writing it, we're still thinking about it, but we'll cover everything from how our democracy works through to how we fund this. Um, Ultimately, it is about challenging neoliberal economic policies of the last 40 years. That will be fundamental to it, and there are going to be people in politics who will balk at that. And ultimately, I think if you understand that in the past 40 years uh, we've polluted, put more carbon out uh, in those 40 years than the rest of history combined, in that, and, and we've known about climate change, uh, you can begin to see that actually this economic model, this way of, of operating, is inimical to being able to challenge um, climate change and environmental destruction. So that means that as a socialist, an eco-socialist, I would say, I think we're perfectly placed to be able to uh, step up to those challenges because one of the key parts of this will be challenging the undemocratic uh, oligarchical financialization of our world economy 
and democratizing it, bringing it back under democratic control to ensure that we can actually afford to make the radical changes required. I know people are talking about the city and the financial world, you know, being, you know, uh, you know carefully herded with key pieces of legislation. Well, we can start there, but I think the time is running out. And I think actually this is going to require a radical democratization of our financial system. And that is a key ask of any uh, socialist government, because ultimately, also for me, it's a key ask of the European Union, which is the most powerful economic bloc in the world, can play a key part in building that new democratic financial world institutions, which I think John Mack is going to talk about in the next couple of days in some of these speeches. If anyone's familiar with uh, Kevin Anderson, who's a, a climate scientist, really outspoken uh, and really strong on the social justice side, he, look, he often quotes a study by Thomas Piketty, which shows, which shows that the 10% of the world's richest um, use 50% of its carbon, and that was actually backed up a bit later again by Oxfam, and that if you brought down the carbon consumption of the 10% richest to that of the average European, you would instantly shave off a third from our carbon emissions. So that gives you a sense of how inequality is kind of tied very closely um, to the situation we're in now. And he, he goes further and says that actually, for, for the amount of carbon we have left that we can burn before we tip ourselves into a very dangerous a climactic and unstable conditions, that, that means that already at this point we shouldn't be able to make luxury cars, yachts, the kind of things that the super rich or even the quite rich um, are using. But that all that money, all that sorry, all that energy rather well, needs to be going into building the new energy infrastructure that we're gonna need. Yeah. So I think those kind of really deep reaching radical propositions are the kind of ways we need to be thinking. If you're thinking about uh, repurposing energy, if you're talking about the Second World War, no one drove a car past uh, 1941 because all the petrol was requisitioned for the war. You know, obviously there were less cars then, but you just simply couldn't drive past did that you, did you, On the war cabinet, I was just looking at this today, I looked and I was interested, on the war cabinet in the Second World War there were two, on none of them in the Second World War was the Treasury included in the war cabinet. The war cabinet it was the kind of smaller scale, immediate version of the, of the wider cabinet. Uh, the Minister of Production was in there, but basically because it was a period of war and desperation and a, and a struggle to be able to survive, which is where I think we're increasingly heading, the, the thought process was, we'll pay for it when we pay for it. Ultimately, can we produce it? The only limitations were uh, labor, and resources. That was it, because we, we had to do it. Uh, and ultimately, I think that there is something in that. Clearly, I'm not saying John McDonnell shouldn't be on, a, uh, on, a, on that war cabinet. Clearly, he should. But ultimately, our whole notion about what we can afford and efficient, you know, neoclassical economic models of what is efficient, what is affordable, these all need to be shaken up and challenged. And I'm really pleased to say that Kevin Anderson is on our um, economic working group um, for the Green New Deal. So it's be quite radical. So I've been quite greedy with my questions. I've just got one more question for Alice and I'm going to open up um, for your <laughs> questions. So I think we can all agree that we need behaviour change, cutting out meat, flying less, stopping flying and other carbon intensive activities. But how can we push for it in a way that doesn't work against the need for collective disruptive actions and kind of much deeper political changes? There was a woman I spoke to at my son's school uh, yesterday and she runs the community garden project there. She was really upset that loads of mature trees have been cut down by a school that's taking over uh, some land next to their school. And when, she, when I mentioned the climate strikers, she was like, well, you know, I told my children not to go because you know they'll probably all just go and drink coffee at Costa from disposable cups. And anyway, I firmly believe that the only action people should take is in their own home. And it's like, it's just like, but you really care about these issues and what the action in people's homes hasn't you know, ever prompted policy change on this level. And I'm kind of linking back to this idea that neoliberalism has made, has kind of eroded people's capacity for uh, in collective action. You know, how, how do we make, all well, those things need to happen, but how do we do it in a way that people understand that by themselves they won't work? Well, I think 
How there's quite um, for some reason, and I can see why it might have happened, but I think it's a, it's dangerous <coughs> that we've let ourselves get into this. We've managed to split political action as something collective, and what we might call lifestyle changes, those sorts of carbon cuts in the the high carbon life that most of us, I'm well, if we're sitting here, we already have quite a high carbon life because I can feel the air conditioning. Um, <laughs> like th- those um, that they are individual, and that's ridiculous because. Um, well, I mean, when it comes to climate change, none of us are an individual. Uh, we can do this exercise of a personal carbon footprint, which I'm sure a lot of us have done, and it can be kind of interesting and we can learn a bit about ourselves and question ourselves through doing it. But none, we are not able to emit as much carbon as we do as individuals. It's only because we are part of a larger social network that we're even able to emit large amounts of carbon. You know, you think about someone on a plane, something, you know, one of the most high carbon things that as an individual you could do is get on a plane. It's not just that you're on the plane with other people, and I suppose if you're super rich, you might have it to yourself, um, but it's all the people who have built that plane, who have mined the materials that produced it, or the generations of engineers that developed the technology. You know, we are only able to do these things through the networks that we're part of. And a lot of these things are social things anyway. We go on holiday with other people, we eat with other people. One of the things that makes it difficult for us to feel able to say we're not going to fly or we're going to change how we eat is because we're part of a social network and we're a bit worried about what our mum will say if we say we're not going to have turkey at Christmas or like you know our family holiday we know the pe- how that a lot I know a lot of people who've had these these conversations with with I'm sure a lot of you have had these conversations with different people like we're going on holiday to x and you're like oh maybe I won't because I don't want to fly or whatever or we're all doing this you know that these these things are all social and so I think the trick to answer your so to get to the point of that would be to think of these lifestyle things as a social activity and to think about how we can increase their, their, their sociality and their virality and how they can be done collectively. So we know from research that if individuals who have, if you know someone who's given up flying, you're more likely to cut down on flying yourself. We've seen how the plant-based eating movement has really just gone. And things like the flight, we had the flight shame movement in Sweden. It's one of the many things that, that uh, Greta seems very good at turning into viral movements. She's given up flying and she's got her mum to give up flying. And people are across Sweden are now talking about flight shame. And this word... Um, has now developed it, we call it flight shame, I can't remember what the Swedish, maybe someone else who knows more Swedish than me knows it, but this word is now being translated into Finnish and German, there are movements around the world growing like this. Um, what we do as an individual will have a social impact, and so uh, we also know that it's something that you can say to your MPs, you say I've done this and I now expect you to do that, so they have, they have social power. Um, So, yeah, we do need to make those behavioural changes, but we'll only see behavioural change. These things will only stick and will only spread if we think of them as a social thing. They're things that we do with others. Um, And I I really worry when when I see other members of the environment movement say all these things that I suppose you could bracket under behavioural change or lifestyle carbon emissions get dismissed as pointless and something that we shouldn't be doing because we only should be doing political stuff. These things have to go together and we have to all be doing all of the things uh, and it's really wrong to dismiss them as individualistic because there are a few people like the woman that you spoke the other day <laughs> who have managed to package some slightly more problematic political ideas to it. I think there's this real space for the left to, to re-own that and for people with a social awareness and of awareness of social networks to think about that a lot more. That's certainly the approach we take at 1010. All of the stuff we do on that is all about how you don't just do something in your own life, but you do it with others, because it'll stick if you do it with others, and how that will also mean it spreads, and that how that will then lead to other political actions, other social movements, all sorts of things. I can use that to avoid my mother-in-law's Christmas cooking and her roast dinner, <laughs> which I never thought of before, so yes, thank you very much. So you, if you enter a pact now with ah. Alice publicly... I can't, eat your, I can't eat your Christmas dinner. Green it's, it's too carbon intensive. <laughs> Green New Deal. Although I think turkeys are, are less... They're not bad, they? are. They? Yeah. Lamb. they have a lot of other environmental impacts, though, I'm sure. Yeah. Okay, well, let's not, let's not go too much into that. <laughs> so um, at this point, I think I'm going to open up for questions. We'll start from here. The lady at the back and the man here at the back. Thank you. Uh, one comment and one question. Comment to the last one. I think the area of change is very important, but it has to go hand in hand with education. So it's not just a social movement, and the crowd talked about it. But the British should be leaders, kind of leaders in the world, not leaders in the world. So education tells people uh, what is worth it. 
and it's why well, it's, uh, it's my issue. So when I travel to Germany next week, I go to, to, to Hamburg, I pay the double, and I always uh, use the train. It's a beautiful train. If you can work on it, you can walk, you can walk around, you can meet. But it's expensive, and it's more expensive because uh, France are subsidized. So then I come to my second um, question. I think you kind of touch it uh, by saying, uh, using the term sustainable economics. And then you talked about um, uh, Hayek, uh, uh, Friedman, uh, neoliberal economics. But all you said, and I was amazed that you didn't mention it, it sounded a bit like a paradigm shift, but not a system shift. Uh, and you mentioned uh, green economics has to be uh, has to uh, green new, new green deal has to be different from the economics now. And just mention it. At the moment we are GDP growth driven. So all the inequality is because it's all the profit being being sitting off by shareholders and by uh, by the CEOs because everything has to be has to grow. We can't grow anymore because our our planet is or our resources are, are uh, finished. And so I think what we need to, uh, to discuss and what we actually, actually have to, to tackle, and I think you're all in the right way, I have to name it, we have to change the whole economic model. Uh, Lucas wrote already a book in 2004, it's very sort of support of a new uh, economics uh, um, um, uh, foundation about exactly this shift, but nobody talks about it. So we shouldn't even just name the new Green Deal because, as you said, it's a paradigm shift. We have to talk about a new economic model yeah. away from those. Yeah. Okay. Do you just want to take that and then we'll do them together? Yeah, so ask your question. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we're all in a, an echo chamber mm -hmm. um, and it's not touched parts of society. and. We need to reach out to them, and I think that we need the sort of labelling that we've got on cigarette packets. So people going about their everyday life who never, you know, watch, you know, TV or they never choose the foods that we choose, are confronted with it on a daily basis. So when you've got an advert for a holiday, it's got a big warning <coughs> on it. When you go to the petrol pump, there's a warning. There's, you know, use a bus instead. These are the bus routes near this petrol. You know, we that people who avoid this truth are confronted with it. When we um, make a road sort of, uh, you know, like a network, like a mini hollow, like Orphan Forest has done, you know, don't ask permission. You know, spend a long consultation. We've run out of time, just do it and tell people this is why we're doing it with signage. You know, so it hits those people which are outside of our echo chamber here. That's what I'm saying. That probably we need to think about um, doing stuff incrementally, although we've run out of time, you know, we talk about this UBI, we talk about the four day week. Potentially what we should be asking people is saying, okay. You don't have you, you don't have to work for your company. Get paid the same amount by your company potentially, or give companies a bit of leading. But we say the government will pay you for that fifth day, but you have to spend time in the community doing stuff in the community like litter picking, all the crap that is baked into the soil in our in our um, parks. You know, you have an incremental step and get it out into the streets. Okay, great. I think we'll stop there because we've got quite a few things there. We've got the high cost of trains, we've got a good GDP. How do we, that's really sort of a degrowth question, is, which I'm glad you asked, that was one of my questions as well, um, around, you know, is it just another form of green capitalism? Ultimately, don't we need to deal, you know, start contracting, not growing? So it's a you know it's a good one for a possible future <laughs> treasury um, treasury to person to yes. deal with, um, and then we also had labelling as a way of provoking climate change behaviour, which could possibly take on Alice, and then something about the four day working week, which I know John McDonald is sort of working on something on that now I've heard. So 
Should we start with trains? Does anyone want to say anything about that? <laughs> trains? Making trains cheaper. This has to happen. Subsidies. Flight subsidies. I mean, it's, it's partly the... Yeah, I mean, we also just need to think about what we, how we have flying. So, um, and Miata will probably talk quite a bit about the frequent flyer levy, but that's something that we also campaign on. Um, and we know that 70% of the flights are taken by 15% of the population. Um, we could have a frequent flyer tax, um, which would be one very easy win on these things. Uh, we also just need to invest more in trains. So it's not just about... It's, I think we need to start putting money towards those kinds of, of transport things. One of the things that's heartening about the flight shame movement is we're seeing businesses start to move into this and put pressure into having... So you're seeing in Sweden, you're seeing... Um, companies pop up that are doing um, train-based package holidays and so your whole holiday will be like that so it's sort of like you go on your your yoga retreat and instead of flying to somewhere you go on a train and you do mindfulness on your train and the whole thing is wrapped in together or and some trains in the continent they have crashes so you go on your family holiday and you have a children's carriage for the kids to have fun on on your route to the holiday and your journey is part of the holiday so i think we need to see things like that too um, I didn't, do you want to talk more about it? Is it something that I know Ted Ted has done and my colleague Leo is spearheaded, but it's very much associated he's, with that. He's got me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's. He, uh, I mean, can I just, I mean, very quickly. So, our, co our colleague Leo, who works in my office for a little while, who's your colleague as well, you know, has obviously got me into the papers because he works for me and on the frequent flyer levy. And one of, this is a really important point. The Sun, already, you can really begin to see how the right wing media represents neoliberal vested interest and power structures already got their knife and fork out. So because Leo likes the frequent fly levy, I like it as well, but they've come to attack me for being able to say that the frequent flyer. So basically, um, you know, 20% of people in this country don't, uh, can't afford to fly, uh, have never set foot on a plane. Uh, and yet at the very top, the wealthiest, some of you might be in this room, are, are taking six or seven flights a year. And so, you know, to protect the aviation industry as we're currently doing at the moment, means it's, it's the wrong priority. And so what you would do, you would have a, a tax, which basically the first flight could be free, I don't know, possibly, and then every tax, every flight you take on top basically increase incrementally. There are, there are limits to that. I, I think it's a, a good starting point to start the conversation. I think just to come on to, and just to kind of segue from that, to come on to the GDP issue, I think that's critical. Look, Robert Kennedy wrote 51 years ago, you know, he gave his speech on the limits of growth, on the limits of GDP, as a metric to be able to measure what's important. That speech is probably worth going away and reading, and it's probably way ahead of its time and now more important than ever. Now, as a Treasury Minister, a shadow Treasury Minister, to sit here and say, I want to end economic growth, there are people tweeting, and guarantee I'll be back in the Sun newspaper <laughs> tomorrow. So how do we have this conversation? Um, well, first of all, I think there's widespread political and economic acceptance that the metrics, GDP, established in the 1930s by Kuznets, isn't fit for purpose anymore. It doesn't measure what we need to measure. Uh, and ultimately, if you go out of this room and pollute, you're increasing GDP. Now, we all know that we want to see more steel produced, more renewables produced to decarbonize our economy. That is what you would call, if you want, good growth. But we need a metric system that can measure what we want, what we need, more culture, more arts, more time to look after each other, the things that people actually need, the kind of society we want to see, and less on endless consumption, empty cancerous like growth, which is what I think people understand increasingly that the economy can't provide. So we can have that conversation, but it doesn't have to be simply a binary as the sun and others would like, growth or no growth. Because the mindset of this country is that our economic well-being is dependent on economic growth. It actually isn't, but that's the mindset that is established deep in our collective economic psychologi psychological um, outlook on how things work, and we've got to challenge that. The, last, the other thing I would say on deliberative democracy, it's quite clear to me that one of the kind of key planks of the Green New Deal will be about, broken our, about fixing our broken politics. If you look at Brexit, you know, Brexit isn't the cause of its own existence. It's a, it's a, it's a function of a broken political system. And yet what we know is, whatever we do now, there are likely to be systemic shocks, one after the other, from food security, biodiversity loss, potential uh, climate catastrophes that have yet to materialize, we know that that will have severe impacts on our democracy. So we've got to build resilience into our democracy, but we've also got to start working out 
How do we bring people with us to make these radical changes? If we're going to start saying to people, actually, there is only a certain amount of meat from cows and lambs and so on that people can eat. How do we say that? How do we have that conversation? How do we get through policies which are going to have to see people dramatically decrease in our lifetime the number of flights they take? How do we, prior, how, how do we, how do we begin that conversation? So it's going to need in a democracy people to help start making those decisions and buy into them. We can't dictate from the top. And finally on UBI, we're looking at UBI. One of the things... Explain what that is. So universal basic income. So everyone, irrelevant of your income level, is given um, an amount of money to be able to live on. The next Labour manifesto, we're hoping that there'll be three pilots um, across the country trying different forms of UBI. There are different, start, there are different systems uh, that have been operated across the world, some in India, some in Finland and other places. We'll try that. One of the concerns I have, poor in society get told what they have to do, but the wealthy who won't be relying on UBI don't. So I understand you want to change the dynamics of wealth in our society, but we have to think, we have to think these things through. They sound like good ideas, and they very often are, but we also have to think through the implications. I know most people in this room would have said, I'm in favour of a carbon tax, okay? But when you, think, when you think through what you're actually doing, you're pricing someone's life in a developing world, more, than that, more or less then that's an arbitrary pricing mechanism that you're putting on it with a value system attached to it. So these are things that we need to think about. Yeah, I mean, so just a, just a, just a couple of things. Um, so, I mean, I, I, went, I think the point on the um, frequent flyer levy is that's just one intervention. Um, but the bigger point is we have a very complicated, very expensive subsidy and incentive regime that's baked into the way that we do economic policy that, in, that favours dirty industry, favours dirty investment yes. over clean. And that's the thing you have to unpick. So the frequent flyer levy is just one example, but there's a whole raft. And actually, that, absolutely. And so that, you know, that's the work we need to do. Like, actually, how do we completely dismantle this? You know, uh, you know we're going to be arguing that we actually, for the next five to 10 years, every single budget that comes up should be a green budget. That is looking to dismantle this infrastructure that we've created that massively skews us away from clean towards um, towards dirty, and that's fundamentally wrong. So uh, that's how where I'd put the kind of free, frequent flyer levy. I think your bigger point about um, the new economy is completely right. So, and it's interesting because we've had this kind of debate internally. So for us, the project is about fundamentally changing the economic system. Uh, this is a thing that, you know, the New Economics Foundation has been talking about for 30 years, um, shifting from our kind of GDP free market type of system towards what we talk about well-being economy, where actually we're valuing different things and we're skewing the way our economy works in order to kind of realize that. Um, and the question for us is actually, is the Green New Deal just one route to this, or is it the route? And actually, for us, there are certain things that we can do within this Green New Deal project, but if we try and pack the entire new economy agenda into the Green New Deal agenda, I think our worry is that you kind of, we will, exactly. Um, so the reason why I didn't talk about the bigger change is that actually that is for us the project, but the Green New Deal is one route into that. And, you know, a revised social contract, which is a thing that I think needs to happen after Brexit, will be the other route to that. A conversation about a different type of business, what we call a progressive business, and actually the interaction between business and society and how business see their role within that is another part of that. And at the heart of it has to be a different value for the economy. You know, and for me, I think the thing that's really interesting is, you know, GDP has been this thing that's been quite hard for us to dismantle. Um, because, you know, on the other side, the economists will say, well, it's a measure, but, you know, we know if we get GDP, everyone does better off. We know if we get GDP, that's the way in which we lift living standards. That's the way in which we lift people up. That's no longer the case. So 10 years, we've had GDP, and actually it's had no bearing. The benefits to people aren't being felt. So it's already breaking. Mm. The logic of that model is already breaking. Already yeah, absolutely. So that's where we go in and we say, well, you know, what, what, what is the point of tracking growth if it doesn't make our communities' lives any better? And it's a really common sense thing. So people are like, yeah, why? This is a completely false measure. And we win the argument that way. So it feels like, actually, for the 30 years that NEF have been talking about well-being economics, it is more resonant now than ever before 
because in the public's mind, this thing we're tracking has no bearing on their lives, and so it breaks down. But for me, it's just indicative, indicative of the bigger breakdown in the system. You know, when I'm sort of sitting arguing against, uh, you know, people of the kind of traditional neoliberal, neoclassical view, it's like your entire premise was always based on we let the markets do what they like, and everyone will benefit. We will raise people out of poverty, we will have social mobility, everyone does it better off. Just let the system get on with it. That's no longer the case. So the fundamental roots upon which this whole system has been built, I think is breaking down because it's reached the logical conclusion of where it could go. And so now for me, the space is organizations like ourselves, the bigger movement and ecosystem, now is the time to pile in and say there is a different way to do that. And you know, whether we use the root of the Green New Deal, whether we use the social contract, whatever it is, whether we use the proposition of universal basic services, which is something that we're talking about, it's not enough to monetize it and say, actually, we're just going to give you an income to do X, Y, and Z. Because the risk of that is that it dismantles the collective provision that we think is fundamental for a society. We start talking about a universal basic service, actually, and the expectation of the public that they should require universal childcare, universal education, universal social care, and the conversations, how do we pay for that? So these are all roots for us starting to fundamentally change the system at a point in time where it feels more real now for all the reasons we've been talking about than it has ever felt before. I think I'd just add as well that actually 95% of people globally have never flown, which is a quite good international version of that statistic, because it's quite shocking. Um, and the thing about labelling I think is interesting, because you, perhaps the person who asked that question, there's a lot of parallels drawn between campaigns against smoking and campaigns against use of carbon in terms of the sort of shaming idea, the idea it used to be quite... You could, you know, there's pictures of my mum smoking while breastfeeding. I mean, you just can't really, just wouldn't see that anymore. You know, so there has been a sort of moral shift, like this is damaging, this is hurting other people, and you, 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 you can't do it. So I think there's, there's been a lot of parallels drawn, and I think that labelling is part of it, taxation is part of it, um, the supply and demand. So you tax the people who are extracting the carbon, but you also tax the people who are using it in some some way of kind of capping. The overall use. Um, did you want to add anything about labels? Or you? I can say, um, say something just quickly on it, and that I think, I mean, I'm old enough to remember the smoking ban coming in, looking around the room, I think several of you probably remember that too, and how but that could only come in because there was already what, some level of acceptance about that. And I remember lots of people being like, <gasps> How's this going to work? And I remember being in Scotland the weekend that happened in Scotland, and people were like, Glasgow is not, how, how is this going to work? And it was fine. Um, but there was, uh, although there were a lot of people outraged at the idea that you wouldn't smoke in a pub, um, it was still a level of acceptance that got us before you could pass that. And it's not just that we live in the sort of society where you need some level of acceptance before something will get through Parliament. It's that I don't think it would have worked if there wasn't some level of public acceptance. So when, they've tried, when they tried smoking bans in, in New York much earlier than in, when they had it in, the, in England and Scotland, um, it, people just, they just flouted that rule. And I think that that's something that we need to think about. So Clive says we need to think about how to bring people with us. And I think that needs to be our, our leading approach. Um, one of the, uh, the first question also said we need to educate people. Uh, yes, but I think we just need to work with people. And I think that it's very much, this is definitely, the, you know, I said I came from science communication before I moved to climate comms, and this is something that I really, really have taken from that, is just saying, I know best, and saying that to the public is not going to work. You need to build relationships with people, and you need to make them come with you. And they may well have ideas about how you, how you label things, or how you don't label things, but you do something completely different. And that will be more powerful because it's come from them. And so I feel the desire to get stuff out there and just shift things. And I think you even use the phrase hit people. Um, I sometimes want to hit a lot of people when it comes to climate change, but I don't, I don't think really that long term that's going to be what gets us there. Um, so I think remembering with the, the cigarette stuff in particular, as you say, it's kind of inspiring to look at social change with respect to attitudes to smoking. But remember all the work that went into those changes before they happened. I think you might have hinted uh, at it a little bit earlier when you talked about deliberative processes. Um, Sorry, what processes? Deliberative, deliberative. Mm -hmm. processes. And government today announced uh, uh, setting up citizens' assemblies. So I just was wondering what you think about citizens' assemblies and if you think they should be uh, binding or just an advisory. Would you like to answer the citizens' assembly question? Bye.
no. No. Um, Just quickly pick up on very very quickly negative emissions technologies. um, I think the points. I think the point's been well made um, by my colleague who spoke before. Uh, The 1.5 degree IPCC 1.5 degree uh, centigrade of warming already factors in uh, quite large amounts of negative emission technologies. These are technologies that haven't yet been invented. I mean, they have some of them have been invented but on scale. Um, and I think uh, that probably speaks for itself. And I think you're right. I mean, listening to you there about the uh, geoengineering that people are talking about, I think one of the things I think about when I look at the, what confronts us, I think we have to consider everything everywhere yesterday in many ways. So, you know, look, we're going to have to go back and, and relook at uh, GM crops, which can dramatically be genetically engineered to absorb more carbon. I think we have to look at everything. Uh, We need to look at crops that can survive on less water, that can survive on less uh, soil nutrients. And yet, a big part of the environmental movement is anathema. Clearly, if you're going to allow these technologies to simply replace or stop the radical change that need to take place, that's not an option. It might be that we need to do all. Um, And I think that's something we have to consider. In terms of um, deliberative democracy, uh, I... I'm going to say the same thing as I would about the flying issue, which I think is a really good point, because even if we're flying less, there are some people who are still destroying the planet. Um, I think we've got to be able to get from where we are, we're in a democracy, and we've got to be able to get from where we are at the moment, which is unlimited, expansive flying, to bringing it under control, to eventually working out whether we can actually carry on with it on on any scale at all. And... I don't think, as a political party, if the Labour Party overnight said that we're going to ban flying for the United Kingdom, I can see Boris Johnson having great fun with that. Um, So there are means and ways, and I think obviously that kind of segues into the issue of deliberative democracy. That means we're going to have to chew over some of those crunchy issues in that deliberative democracy, in those citizens' assemblies, that we can begin to tackle those hard questions like I mentioned before. Now, again, do I think that they should be um, instructing rather than advising. I think let's get this off the ground and start with advising because part of the process of having people with those, having those conversations um, with that expert advice and then advising politicians, if it doesn't work, if politicians are going to ignore those members of their constituency of their community who are telling them these things, then I think you'll probably see that it will, the pressure will be for it to shift to the next thing. But I think to get it off the ground, let's start with advising. I think that would be a massive step to get to that point. Yeah, so, I mean, the, 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 the sort of two things, um, you know, your challenging questions I think were really well made. Um, and there was a thread that was running through them, which is all our assumptions at the moment about how we tackle this. Um, bakes into the fact that there will be some carbon emitted. So your point about flying less rather than stopping flying, uh, your point about carbon offsetting rather than just removing carbon, um, and fundamentally that's the link to the question of how we reverse this thing. Um, so to, to answer your very direct question, what the means to reverse it, I don't know. Um, I don't have the answers. Um, but for me, the first step is, you know, I think we need to and this is where we talk about kind of radical change. So actually, when we're setting ourselves the target, the time scale for the target, our ambition versus offsetting versus complete removal, will set the bar for those that are thinking about the technology. If you set your time frame where, you know, at the moment, people are saying this is the technology we have, and therefore we think 2050 is the time scale that we need to be working on. And we think actually we need to do offsetting rather than just complete removal. You shift the goalpost technology will respond. So we've got to create the pressure. And then the job for people like us is to say, okay, well, they've figured out the technology. Our question is, how do we get that technology at scale? How do we fund it? How do we spread it? That's the job of policymakers. But until you start with shifting the ambition about what we're trying to do in a way that forces that chain of process, I don't think it happens. Um, So the challenge is right, and I think it is a challenge for the environmental movement. And, you know, there were some of us that were talking about the Green New Deal and what the plan looks like. Um, And there are part in the movement that's saying, look, it's unrealistic to be talking about anything other than 2045, because that's what the science and the technology tells us is achievable. So you people that are talking about 2025 over there, it's crazy, it's for the birds. And I said, well, look, there's probably somewhere in between, but unless we stretch ourselves collectively, Mm, actually everything else won't fall into place. The pace of technological change, the pace of business change will be much slower. 
And I don't think we have the luxury of that. Um, so I think there's a process. I think your point is very well made. Um, on the Citizens' Assembly, so I think there's a really important role in deliberative democracy, uh, particularly where, the, where there are hard social choices and trade-offs that will be made. Um, but in the end, I think, you know, my view is that the scale of change that we're talking about requires much bigger public consent. So having a body that allows us to sort of pick through and think about something that makes sense, that feels like it has more democratic engagement than our current political system, because in some respects it is broken, helps. But we need that political system to work so that actually we can exercise much bigger democratic control and consent on what happens. So I go back to, I go back to you know, the, the power of the social movement is the fact that you're trying to galvanize a much bigger swathe of the population to get consent for some of these changes that then puts political pressure on this democratic system that we do have, that we need to get working better. Um, and so it, it is a helpful tool given where we are, but I don't think it will answer all the questions. Um, the lady here at the front and a woman here at the back. So if we start with you. The government's declared a climate emergency, but done nothing about it. They're relying on this committee of climate change, which has made these reports for 2050, and they're merely mouthed. There are simple things they could do straight away, and I want to know why they haven't done it. They could. Everyone's fussing about air pollution. Why don't they bring in a 60 miles per hour maximum speed, and then a 50 mile an hour maximum speed? They'll get slightly less tax revenue from the, the petrol. But it could be done fairly quickly. It affects everyone equally. The other thing they could do is go back to making sure that all new houses are zero carbon built. To build things which need retrofitting is nonsense. Thank you. And the lady at the back, please. Um, Clark made a point earlier about the problems with putting a value on the life of people in Africa, but every decision a politician makes puts a value on the life of every person in this room. From the minute we're born, with the amount of funding that goes into the NHS, to the level of benefits we're given, to the level that our teachers are paid, we, are all, we all have an intrinsic value based on our potential, but then we are all given a worth in every stage of our life. People who can afford to pay for extra, are always valued more because they can pay to make sure they get the best of everything. So why don't we do the same with our food, with our flights, etc. and say, if you can pay for this, fine, but then you have to make sure that you're paying enough so that the people who below you who can't afford it are able to have their same opportunities. Or if you don't want to do that, then you're not allowed to have this because why should you have something that you're denying the person next to you? That would be another way of looking at trying to decarbonise and decarbonise and making things fairer. Thanks. Um, do, you want to take, do you want to take? Because you've got to go. Do you want to um, I, I, I think you make a valid point. Um, I, I think it was a point rather than a question. Um, in terms of uh, why the government isn't doing this, well, they're Tories. And, um, you know, they're libertarian, deregulating, tax avoiding, trickle down, deregulating bullshit that, that, that drives their economic and world outlook. And that means that their talk about climate will always be greenwash because they cannot, they cannot ideologically, they are incapable of rising to the challenge that ecological destruction and climate change represents. It's simply impossible for them to do that, I believe. And you could have someone like Rory Stewart as their leader. It still wouldn't be enough because ultimately what they would be talking about is tweaking. It's why I also feel personally that Liberal Democrats, in many ways, will talk a good game. But ultimately, we are talking about uh, challenging fundamentally some of the key tenets of the capitalist system that we have in place. That's why I genuinely feel that only an ecologically minded socialism is going to be able to deal with this. Now, some people say, well, that's ideological claptrap. That's simply not true. I think if we began to approach this back in 2006, when Stern and others were saying, you know, this was the most cost effective path, we may well have been able to do it within the bounds of this economic model, possibly. I don't know, maybe, in terms of climate change, possibly. But where we are now, you know, you speak to some scientists and they'll say we've already reached a tipping point. 
And I'm not being too pessimistic here. So nothing ex short of a radical, dramatic change. And let's not forget, you know, in the Second World War, Winston Churchill brought in socialists to make sure that we could mobilize the economy to do this. If you think about the New Deal, where the Green New Deal originated from, Roosevelt was literally a socialist, comparatively a socialist in what he did in terms of, you know, the, um, in terms of taking on the financial regulation, moving away from the gold standard, in terms of the mass investment to tackle the dust bowl, to tackle unemployment. The regulations that then came in in the 40s in the war economy, admittedly, on production limitations, on, it was a very, very much a socialist economy and arguably stopped fascism uh, from, from taking hold of America. So my argument is this, the reason the government are prepared to carry on spinning out greenwash is because they are ideologically incapable of rising to the challenge. And I think that ultimately the public are going to and are beginning to realise that. Yeah, I mean, the point on ideology, um, uh, it is, it is part of, I think it is part of the challenge. Um, and I, I'm, I, I'll take a slightly nuance for you uh, to, to, to Clive's point, which I take, a, I, I agree with a lot what he's saying. But for me, so the government haven't really focused on climate change, partly because, yes, there's some ideology, uh, but because there was no real public pressure for them to do so. Um, and I, I really think the power of the public to shift the dial, so the reason why they're now talking about it, and there's a question, there's a test about whether it is all whitewash or whether there's substance behind it, is because the politics now makes sense. You know, there are huge sways of their constituents that actually are talking about this stuff. So they have to make the electoral shift. So I don't, th so I think, I think a different mindset is ideological because I think there is a school of thought that is baked into everything from how the treasury works through to how we govern. You know, I, I worked in the civil service for 10 years um, and I go and talk to my former colleagues about the new economy and they look at me like I'm mad. Like it's a, it's, and, and it's baked into the, the way they're taught. It's baked into every aspect. And that is ideological. But, you know, civil servants don't believe it's ideological. It's just a way of doing things. And that's the thing that we need to crack that makes it quite hard for people to engage in a kind of bigger question. Um, but for me, you know, I think ideologies do change and can change. Um, and, you know, I look at a lot of things that, you know, even within the five-year space, there were certain things that were of the left that have now been adopted by the Conservatives. So I think it, the, the dial can shift. And where there's public pressure to create a new common sense around some of this stuff, um, I think that's where we start to move them. Now, you will always get progressive governments that will be far more radical and ambitious than others. But for me, you need to get to a point where there is at least a kind of consensus common sense that just shifts us. And I, and I, I generally think that the urgency of both the environmental challenge, but the economic challenge, which will galvanize the public, will start to shift that. So, and my hope is that you have progressive governments that push us as far, but you make it absolutely impossible for a conservative government to unpick that because the new common sense is that we need to do some of this stuff different. And unless it comes from the bottom, unless there's public pressure, I don't think you can shift the ideology. Uh, so yes, it's baked in and it's incredibly hard, but I think it's changing. I think it has to change. I think there is an urgency that will force so the you, change. Do you think they'll, you think even though Theresa May has just announced her net zero strategy, which has left you know, a large amount of space for Heathrow and aviation. You think that in the timescales we're talking, in the next five years, the Tory party mindset will basically understand that Heathrow is, is not just a mistake, that actually they may need to contract flights elsewhere? Uh, so I think if it starts becoming a vote loser, then yes. So it won't come from the heart. It won't be intellectual. It will come from where public pressure is. You know, so for me, you know, yes, there's this whole thing that's happening in Westminster and Whitehall, but the power lies with the public. It really does. And actually, the bigger the social movement, the bigger the political pressure, when they think it's a vote leader, they'll stop doing it. They could get away without talking. Yeah, but it's common sense, that's what I'm saying, because we're not dealing with a lot of the strategy in the moment. We're dealing with middle of the road, all the way down, middle of the road. So... So, to, I mean, to answer your question directly, I think, so I'm giving you a response to the tactics of where I think the politics are. Um, that doesn't stop my organisation, that doesn't stop you arguing for something radical. My very point is that you need people like us doing it in order to raise the public debate. And the change we get, 
You don't change at the top unless you create change from the bottom. And that's my fundamental point. So the way that we shift the ideology is, my God, we create a social movement that is so loud, so angry, and so vehement about how imminent and how urgent. That's the thing that shifts the politics. But if you expect the politics to just change on its own, I think that's for the birds. And this is why I think it's so imperative that people are galvanized around this and that the movement becomes bigger. So you reach out and you're talking about millions of people saying we want something different. If we don't have that, we're not going to have the change. And hoping that, with all due respect, we've got amazing politicians, but hoping the political system on its own will respond, I don't believe that will happen. And I think that's the game changer. And for me, why I'm hopeful is that I think the conditions are there for the kinds of change we were talking about, because the system is breaking down. And it is beholden on all of us to mobilize that opportunity, to exploit that opportunity to drive change. Yeah. I think everything you said, I, I do agree with. Um, what I would say is, though, it's in terms of the timescales we're talking, um, and 12 years could shrink yet. Yeah. Uh, five, yeah, and I think it will. And I know there's some papers that are due out which will show that it's uh, less time than that and deeper cuts. It, at the same time that you've got a Conservative Party that's shifting, I'd say, closer towards uh, Trump, and the Tea Party in terms of its politics. I, I, I'm struggling in those time frames. I, you know, I don't know where we have time to wait for them. There are maybe 27 people that voted for Rory Stewart, maybe there are another 10 on top of that. Um, I'm, I'm kind of thinking to myself that actually, for many of them, the choice is to double down. Actually, more deregulation, more moving towards where Trump and America is. And I think they actually, they genuinely believe, you know, they genuinely believe in their ideology will deliver the results. I mean, let's not forget, a large number of them are still deniers about what's happening at the moment. So I, I agree, though, this isn't going to happen unless there's a hegemonic shift of power. Um, and to do that, you need a kind of, you need a radical government, I would argue radical Labour government, that can get that emotion, which makes it, like after 45, makes it almost impossible for a future Tory administration to be able to shift back um, the other way. And, you know, after 45, from 45 to 79, there was a hegemonic agreement, if you want, consensus in this country that the welfare state, the NHS, the social contract would be in place. And that's now been broken and whittled <coughs> away. And we now need to re rebuild a new one, which people from Boris Johnson onwards feel that they have to buy into. The choice, the alternative to that, is I think something darker, something more ominous something more dystopian without being too scaremongery. Um, so on that point, uh, that's why I would say on trade unions, you know, look, first of all, I think it's, they're not homogenous. So there are a lot of trade unions who are in a really good place on climate. And let's be quite clear, we need to be working with organised labour. We need every ally we can get, and they are an actual ally. And in terms of some of the um, tra larger trade unions who could be and have been what I would call problematic in some of their attitudes and approaches to this issue. There's a couple of things here. First of all, sometimes listening to them, I was listening to a general secretary the other day talk about climate change and energy. I kind of think you just need, it sounds patronizing, but they need good, robust scientific advice. And I'm not sure they're getting that, is the first thing. Um, but secondly, as well, their members are not immune from the general public discourse that's going on. You know, they can see climate change happening. Now, I understand if your job is reliant on, uh, if you work in the fossil fuel industry, you're probably going to be pretty committed to your job and your community and want to keep it. But nonetheless, you know, the big trade unions, not all of their members are in fossil fuels, aviation, and other destructive um, uh, 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 industries. So those unions are, st are still very big unions, but they also have lots of members who will be very concerned about this and we want to see their policy shift. And I think the job of politicians, we've heard the term just transition, but I think it's quite clear. We've seen what's happened in France with the Gilets jaunes and so, and so forth. We understand that if you want to be able to reach those hard to get to communities, those communities that have been forgotten behind, people who often voted leave, who can see no future for themselves, their family, their community, then you have to offer hope. And that hope isn't necessarily going to be the fact that we're going to ban flights and stop you eating meat. That isn't going to really win those people over. But what will win them over is that new social contract. 
And behind and underneath that new social contract can be the engine of driving our way towards a more sustainable economy. But they're going to get a job. They're going to get improved public services. They're going to see better education, better facilities, better resources, more time to spend with their family, their parents looked after properly. That's part of the deal. And when people understand that, I think they'll embrace it. Okay, thanks. Um, I can say something very quickly about HE, if that would Yeah, I think just, that's great, so, and we'll probably end on that. Just to answer that, the other question about universities, because I used to work in the university sector. Um, in fact, I was thinking, when you were speaking, you were talking about um, scientific advice to trade unions, and well, I, when I was a historian of science, one of the things I studied was people, radical science movement in the 1970s and how they worked very closely with the unions and how they gave scientific advice to workers because that was something that... Um, you know, businesses could have access to scientific advice, but the workers couldn't. And, and that's kind of died away. And actually, you, just hearing you say that makes me think there's a huge role for how scientists yeah. could work more effectively with other people in society who don't otherwise, don't currently have access to their research. And that could be part of the sort of thing that, you, you know, you were saying, what could universities do to think about how they could repair students and how they could work with their staff to think about how they could play more of a role in this big transformational change. And I'd love to see projects like that. There's an amazing project at UCL by run by a wonderful woman, no relation, but she's called Sarah Bell. Um, and she works with engineers to get, to allow engineers to give um, kind of, it's on a similar way as you get pro bono legal advice. Um, because there's no mechanism for engineering advice to be, give, to be accessed by people who aren't rich enough to hire an engineer. And so she's done some amazing work with housing groups and stuff like that. And it would be, um, some universities have started taking models like that out and offering it to students as something they can get involved in. I'd love to see more like that. Oh, to bring this into sort of like less of a just an HE policy thing, uh, but maybe some of the larger points, I would be really interested to see how the university sector react to the youth strikers joining them next year <laughs> and how in the next few years they're also going to be having to talk to youth strikers who are saying, I'm not going to come to you because you're not offering me anything. We've got five, ten years. Why would I bother going to university? And how that means that university sector start to go, oh, I might change. Um, We've seen some really amazing things come out of student movements and the universities over the years. <laughs> universities have a big driver in our understanding of climate change. Um, and I think we could see some more. I'm really excited to see what we might see. And I think the youth strikers might well be some of the ones to really poke them. Okay, brilliant. I think that's actually a great uh, note to end on. I'm just gonna, um, I'm just gonna finish by summing up a little bit a few of the things that have been said tonight. Um, which can sort of add up to a kind of guidance about how we can avoid climate breakdown or some pointers. And I'll start with the... Uh, I'm going to shoot because I really want to hear that. But, but thank you very much. <laughs> it's been a pleasure to be here tonight. point that the conditions are there for change we can take that as our starting point um, we heard that we have to stop seeking the magic word to unlock climate action so we need Ian Beale in EastEnders <laughs> joining Extinction Rebellion uh, but we, more, and more seriously we need to focus on the who and the how rather than expend, expecting language to solve everything for us um, we heard about the idea of the green industrious revolution about well-being economics and the Green New Deal is a really important way to get us there. We also heard that there's a place for apocalyptic predictions and that we need to allow people to freak out. We heard as well that uh, we need to think about how to make individual actions go viral and re and own that and to, how to build on that individual social power and make it stick and make it spread. We also took the lesson that the laser focus on climate change, while brilliant, cannot collapse the focus in all other areas where the environment is at risk. And we heard that we need everything everywhere yesterday, which is really a point that we need to set the ambition high and the pace fast and really balance as much as we can our vision for how we want the world to be, but it to be realistic enough that we bring people with us. And I think that's really um, 
where it ends, that we can't do this without social movements and we can't do this without public pressure and we can't do this um, without people really coming with us. And that's a good point to remind everyone that tomorrow is the next school strike. Uh, so if you do have children, support them, or if you're able to go down and support them, I'm sure they will appreciate it. So I hope, um, really fantastic questions. Thanks so much. Sorry we couldn't do more. It's nearly two hours, so I think you need to be released. Um, but I hope you've heard enough to give you that sense of um, conditional optimism, which is the feeling that I came away with um, after researching this magazine. So before we wrap up, I'll just say really quickly, that if you like some of the ideas you've heard tonight, this is what our magazine, New Internationalist, is really all about. We do have some copies of the Climate Magazine for sale at the back, and if you're tempted to try our subscription, we have a special offer of two issues for two pounds, and there are forms for that at the back. And we also bought some books um, on environmental issues that we've published. We've got feedback forms, please do fill one in, let us know. Um, and we've got refreshments in the other room, so feel free to stick around till at least nine and have some of those, because it's late and you must all be hungry. So I think, really, finally, thanks to Resource for London for hosting us. A big thank you to all of you for coming, but the biggest thanks of all to our panelists. Thank you.